Zorro's like the original nerdy guy, you know, who's not a real physically strong guy, but he is capable and has skill with the sword and very intelligent, who was sort of like a Renaissance man. And at night, he turns into this avenging do-gooder who helps the poor and the oppressed. So I think there lies the appeal of Zorro. 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 ¿Quién era el zorro? ¿De dónde vino? De hecho, nunca existió un héroe viviente conocido como el zorro. Tampoco un personaje folclórico español similar. El muy adinerado pero tímido don Diego Vega y su elegante alter ego, el zorro, sorpresivamente tuvieron un comienzo humilde. Fueron la creación de un tranquilo periodista y escritor de tiras cómicas que vivía en la ciudad de Nueva York llamado Johnston Macaulay. Well, Zorro began in 1919 uh, in the pulp magazines. Now, you have to understand what pulp magazines are. Before the days of television, before the days of the uh, Republic serials, the great form of popular entertainment was the pulp magazines. You would go to the newsstand for a dime. You would, you would get the beginnings, not the whole story, but the beginning of a story by writers like Johnston McCulley's. Now, let's call them hack writers. And why were they hack writers? They were getting a paid a penny a word. Um, uh, Tarzan was created in the pulp magazines as well. And Johnston McCulley uh, had created m quite a number of characters before Zorro, but Zorro somehow caught on him. La historia original de Macaulay describía a Don Diego Vega, cuyo nombre en versiones posteriores cambiaría a De la Vega, como un californiano de ascendencia española de 24 años, hijo de una familia prominente y adinerada. Cuando Don Diego tenía 15 años, escuchó historias de que los habitantes de la zona eran perseguidos. Entonces, comenzó a mantener una doble personalidad. Don Diego pretendía tener poco interés en las actividades normales de los caballeros, mientras que en secreto aprendía a cabalgar y desarrollaba sus habilidades de la lucha con espada. Según la fábula, cuando dominó ambas habilidades, se puso una máscara, una capa negra y se convirtió en el zorro. Zorro was clearly right out of the imaginations of, of Johnson McCulley. And frankly, as we have tried to historically put together um, uh, the background for the character, we came to realize, as we studied real California history, that Johnson McCulley either knew very little about real California history or cared very little about real California history. And his Los Angeles is sort of like Batman's Gotham City. It's kind of New York, but it's really a fictional place and a fictional milieu. If there's one thing about the Zorro story that's uh, uh, rather remarkable, it's the absence of California history. He sets it in old California, but he breaks all the rules as far as geography, context, uh, even the plants are all wrong. He has a Zorro riding through eucalyptus groves when there weren't any in California at that time and not for many, many years thereafter. The original title of the Zorro stories was The Curse of Capistrano. San Juan Capistrano has nothing to do with Los Angeles. Uh, the only reason I think he did it was because Curse and Capistrano sounded very good going together, uh, better than perhaps the, the Curse of Los Angeles. Se conoce poco sobre Johnston Macaulay o sobre lo que lo indujo a crear al zorro. Algunos creen que se inspiró en un personaje ficticio, el Pimpinela Escarlata. Otros especulan que a pesar del aparente descuido de Macaulay por la precisión histórica, el zorro pudo estar basado en un famoso bandolero de California de mediados del siglo XIX. Quizá Joaquín Murrieta o el menos conocido Salomón Pico. Solomon Pico often rode at night, struck under the full moon, rode El Camino Real, and especially the further, less well-traveled sections, as Zorro was supposed to do, they left his mark on his victims, living or dead, a road for justice for all in the end. Uh, his life through life changed, as we all do, but in the end he defended justice for all people, including against his own people. And again, Zorro did all this. Was there a character like Zorro in California history? It's an interesting question. And I think like many romantic heroes, there are precedents in other stories or other characters' lives. And when you create a character, you take from, take from the world around you. So if there were influences, you know, or things that you'd heard about something, you take a characteristic from here, you take a setting from there, and you create a world. And that's what I think he did. Al crear su mundo ficticio, Johnston Macaulay 
también se sirvió de hechos pertenecientes a diferentes periodos. So sometimes we've tried to say, well, what year did Zorro really take place? And we've scratched our heads and come up with a, well, a compromise. We call it 1820, but, but uh, from Johnson McCulley, McCulley's writings, it's really impossible to make a determination. I think it uh, probably was around 1820. It's really amorphous. It was at the, essentially, the beginnings of the Rancho period. The missions were at pretty much their height. The last of the famous 21 missions was created in 1823. And the missions by that time were fairly successful in terms of what they were doing in their economy, mission agriculture. By 1822, California is a province of Mexico. So within about that four year time frame, uh, between the end of Spanish rule and the beginning of uh, Mexican California. El único hecho que estaba claro era que en 1919, la historia del zorro atrajo la atención de los lectores leales a las tiras cómicas, quienes gustosamente pagaban cada semana para ver cómo terminaría la maldición del capistrano. En el capítulo final, el zorro le confiesa a todos que él es realmente Don Diego y proclama que el señor zorro no volvería a cabalgar. La historia del zorro había terminado para siempre con este último capítulo si no hubiera sido por un héroe de Hollywood que estaba decidido a que el señor zorro, sin duda, cabalgara nuevamente. En 1920, Warren Hardy fue electo presidente. Comenzó la prohibición y la sensación del cine cuando Douglas Fairbank contrae matrimonio con la novia de Norteamérica, Mary Pickford. Fue el mismo año en que Fairbanks produjo y protagonizó la primera película del zorro, La Marca del Zorro. I think the, the way that uh, Douglas Fairbanks found um, Johnson McCulley's um, first book and um, used that and trans transitioned that into film is one of the romantic stories that sort of fits with the character of Zorro because apparently right after he and Mary Pickford got married and went on their honeymoon, he had found this book and he took it on their honeymoon and he read it and he loved it and he came back and he made the movie and it was the first film that they produced at their studio. Sería muy apropiado que la historia de cómo Fairbanks halló al zorro fuera tan romántica como una aventura del zorro. Pero no todo el mundo lo recuerda de esa manera. Well, the story goes as far as I can remember, that the story was brought to him by a friend of the family who also was, a, was a, uh, an agent, literary agent, called Ruth Allen, who read it in a pulp magazine and suggested that it might be adapted as a possible vehicle for my father. That's the way I remembered it. The way Zorro made a, a transition from the pulps to the silver screen is because uh, Douglas Fairbanks picked up on it immediately and said, oh my God, this is a, just the kind of swashbuckling adventure which would be perfect for me, and uh, immediately acquired the rights, and in those days things happened very quickly, and within months of Zorro hitting the newsstand for the very first time, uh, Douglas Fairbanks was on the set shooting his version of it. He was a very inventive person, and so I'm sure what he saw in Zorro was not so much what was on the page as what it could become on film. He was looking for some kind of action picture to make a break from drawing room comedies, uh, romantic sort of stuff, and so this was his first action vehicle, and he probably saw in it what he could turn it into, the, the acrobatics, the, the lively laughter, the, you know, the sword play, the carving of the Zs. Well, maybe Zorro was the perfect vehicle uh, for him rather than he for Zorro because, well, who else was there at the time or even now who had the ability to act properly, a character part where you played really two parts, dual role in a way, uh, and still be so athletic and so like a, almost like his athletics were more like a dancer, like a ballet dancer more than just stunts as such. And they worked out with such detail in advance and practice on so but uh, well, there just wasn't anybody else before or since who could be so versatile, I guess. Douglas Fairbanks pretty much invented the Zorro that we know, the dark costume, the mask, carving the Zs, you know, and the secret hideaway. 
in the house, the, uh, the clock for going down into the subterranean cavern, all those kind of features that we associate with the Zorro character. And then what he did with Don Diego, playing Don Diego as a fop. In the, in the Curse of Capistrano, Don Diego was kind of a, a dandy or a fop. But uh, Fairbanks pushed it a little bit to the effeminate side. And that was his invention. Parecía que la película sería un fracaso debido a la escasa asistencia al preestreno. Pero la marca del zorro estaba a punto de dejar su marca en el mundo. A pesar de la reacción poco entusiasta del preestreno, la marca del zorro debutó en 1920 y fue un éxito inmediato. The energy, the excitement, all the acrobatic stuff he could do. And this laugh, you see, Douglas Fairbanks would give a throwing back his head, taunting, ha, 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 kind of laugh, you know. And that caught on with kids, and it caught on with the female audience. Uh, it made it really popular movie. And it's lasted all these years because he does somersaults, flips, leaps from the ground onto a mantelpiece. He was the first action hero. That star quality could play any part. Plus, you have a man, not only a fine actor, but also a fine athlete. And very exciting to watch him do these stunts. He was an athlete. He had physical prowess, but he needed a little help from Hollywood. Okay, so he did have special trampolines set up out of camera range where he could jump up, up on the on the verandas of the senoritas uh, when he's escaping from the bad guys. You know. He had stuntmen to assist him on certain things. So yes, he did most of it himself, okay? But he did have a little help from Hollywood. He throw in all these magic tricks to try and show us that, you know, when he was Don Diego, it was still the same clever guy. Keep the audience going with that character so the audience would lose it when they were watching Don Diego. People ask why my father thought of putting magic tricks into the uh, character. I think myself, you know, at this distance in time, this, because he liked doing it in real life. He liked doing magic tricks. He liked picking up little gags and tricks and playing them out at dinner parties or just talking uh, to somebody in his office or whatever. He always had some little trick in his pocket or, that he heard about or read about or seen. Never quite grew up. He's sort of a Peter Pan. Johnston McCulley creó al zorro. Douglas Fairbanks le dio vida. McCulley redefinió el zorro en sus historias futuras según el modelo de Fairbanks. Debido a la creciente popularidad del personaje, McCulley publicó las nuevas aventuras del zorro en forma de tiras cómicas en 1922 y reimprimió el original La Maldición de Capistrano como un libro llamado La Marca del Zorro en 1924. Al año siguiente, en 1925, Douglas Fairbank estrenó su segunda película, Don Q, El Hijo del Zorro. Don Koo tuvo la misma popularidad que la marca del zorro, gracias a las habilidades de actor y de productor de Douglas Fairbank. A pesar de que él le diera el crédito a otros, al director y al escritor. A pesar del éxito de las dos películas del zorro, Douglas Fairbank no volvería a interpretar al personaje. Fairbanks dio al zorro una personalidad. Luego, Republic Picture le daría una voz. Father. The day we prayed and planned for is at hand. Never again will the peons be enslaved for taxes. The first Sam film was Republic's Bold Caballero, and that came out in 1936. Matter of fact, uh, Republic's wanted to be experimental with it. They used their hi-fi sound, starred Robert Livingston as the first sound Zorro. And he was kind of a good-looking fellow, light-colored eyes, you know. And they played it up very much as a Western kind of character. En 1937, Republic Picture continuó con la saga del zorro, 
pero esta vez en forma de serie y ambientada en el oeste. Así surgió El Zorro Cabalga de nuevo. Zorro was also made for serial representation as well and became a great hero of the of the Republic serials, the cliffhangers of the of the 30s. And with these Republic serials, um, what would happen is that you would go to typically 13 chapters of them and you would go on Saturday afternoon and you'd see your favorite hero uh, uh, dueling and making uh, and, and dealing with the villain of the week. And at the end of that uh, episode, there would Zorro be. And you knew, ah, oh, my hero's gonna die. This is, no way can he escape. This is it, it's over, done with. But if you want to see how he's gonna survive, you have to go back to that very same theater next week. Probably the stunt work was the strongest aspect of the serials. As a matter of fact, it was so strong that it's been repeated in a lot of contemporary movies. When you watch Raiders of the Lost Ark and Indiana Jones uses the whip across the tree branch to go across the ravine, that came out of Zorro's Fighting Legion. When he goes under the truck and then comes back on with the whip, that came right out of Chapter 8 of Zorro's Fighting Legion. So the stunt work was probably some of the strongest and most often repeated stuff. La serie de Republic Picture sacó al zorro de la California española y lo situó en algún lugar del oeste. En 1939, un caricaturista de 18 años llamado Bob Kane lo tomó y lo dejó caer en medio de Ciudad Gótica. Zorro tuvo una gran influencia en la creación de Batman. Cuando era 13 años, vi la marca de Zorro con Douglas Fairbanks Sr., He was the most swashbuckling, daring do superhero I've ever, ever seen in my life. And he, he left a lasting impression on me. And of course, later when I created the Batman, it gave me the dual identity. Because Zorro had the dual identity. Bruce Wayne, board society playboy. Zorro, board society playboy. But at night, the do-gooders who fight evil and fight against the oppression and little, for the little man. So what you do is you influence at one point by another character, but then you embellish and bring your own individuality into it, which I did with Batman. Otherwise, it would be a blatant copy, which it is not. I think what's important to know about Zorro and its creator, Jonathan McCulley, is McCulley really laid out the blueprint for all of the subsequent costumed fictional crime fighters. And everybody from Superman to Batman to the Lone Ranger and more recently to Spider-Man or any other, most other characters you can think of owe a debt to Zorro. Para finales de 1930, el zorro había sido transformado en vaquero y en vampiro, pero no pasaría mucho tiempo antes de que regresara a su forma original en la película The Fox. En 1940, la 20th Century Fox ignoró todas las mutaciones anteriores del zorro y dio un paso hacia atrás con la repetición de la marca del zorro. Sin embargo, Douglas Fairbank sería un actor difícil de seguir. La representación del zorro de Douglas Fairbank en 1920 estableció la forma según la cual serían juzgados los próximos zorros. Cuando la 20th Century Fox decidió rehacer la marca del zorro en 1940, sería un desafío encontrar un actor apropiado que siguiera los pasos de Fairbanks. Afortunadamente, la Fox tenía bajo contrato a un joven actor que seguiría los pasos del legendario actor. Su nombre era Tyron Power. He was the most popular male lead of 1939. He was 27 years old. He was just perfect for the part. And he wanted to do more action-adventure kind of things. He'd been in a film called The Black Swan and played a pirate. And I think he wanted to keep doing some of these action-adventure kind of roles, get away from, like, the Alexander's Ragtime Band, drawing room comedy kind of image. And the same kind of thing Douglas Fairbanks did with The Mark of Zorro in 1920. I think the first time that I ever knew there was such a thing as a Zorro, it was when I saw the first film and fell in love with Tyrone Power. He was so beautiful. He was such a hero. He was dashing. And um, I fell in love with the movie and Linda Darnell, and I saw myself playing that part. And I was completely convinced of the love affair and the fantasy, and it was just one of the best movies I ever saw. 
Una vez más, la marca del zorro robaría los corazones de una generación y una vez más su protagonista se convertiría en un héroe de acción. Su éxito se debió en parte a la experta dirección de Ruben McMullian, al prodigioso disfraz y al considerable talento del coprotagonista Basil Rathbun. The 1940 marca Zorro it has the best sword fight ever filmed. Basil Rathbone was really a fencer. Right after they limber up and they start the sword fighting, they decide to show off to one another. And Capitan Pasquale's been going around all through the movie, you know, flashing his sword. Well, he whips that F.A. across the candle and cuts it in half. And he kind of ha-ha-ha shows off how he can cut it in half. And then Tyrone Power takes his sword and whoosh, cuts his candle in half, and it doesn't move. So you cut back to Basil Rathbone. He's like, oh, what a disappointment. And Tyrone Power picks up his candle, and he's cut it perfectly neatly. It's a great scene. La nueva marca del zorro reintrodujo al héroe a toda una nueva audiencia. Nuevamente el zorro tenía éxito. Aparecieron más series del zorro en los años 40, pero sin tener mucha relación con el zorro original. En la serie de 1944, el látigo negro del zorro, Linda Sterling caracterizaba a una justiciera en Idaho. Linda Sterling, the Zorro's Black Whip, only in the title. They had this post-war serial. As a matter of fact, it's First Republic post-war serial. And it starts off with a character called the Whip. It's the Black Whip. And he's killed in the first segment. Randy. And Linda Sterling, all dressed in black, takes over as the whip. But it doesn't have a darn thing to do with Zorro. <laughs> His name is not even mentioned in the whole thing. All 12 chapters. You know. En 1947, en El Hijo del Zorro, George Turner interpretó no al Hijo del Zorro, sino a un pariente lejano, por parte de la madre, que luchaba contra los políticos corruptos en el oeste. Y la serie de 1949, El Fantasma del Zorro, fue protagonizada por Clayton Moore, el hombre que luego haría famoso el llanero solitario, al luchar contra los chicos malos de una mina. Para 1940, el interés del público por el zorro comenzó a disminuir y él, casi literalmente, se convirtió en un personaje de tiras cómicas. The first Zorro comic book came out in 1949, when they re-released... The Mark of Zorro, the 1940 Mark of Zorro with Tyrone Power. And actually, the comic book went back to The Curse of Capistrano and the original Mark of Zorro book. And it follows that story, not the movie. A guy by the name of E.R. Kunstler drew a couple of the Zorro comic books that are kind of dark and malevolent looking. And they had the painted covers like the pulp magazines. They're interesting comic books because even though the comic book code had gone into effect. And most comic books were trying to get kind of silly and lighthearted. On the back cover of a couple of these Zorro comic books, there's the, the bad guy with a blood-soaked Z carved in his forehead, you know? A principios de los años 50, el Zorro había desaparecido de las películas norteamericanas. El personaje seguía apareciendo en algunas tiras cómicas y estaba comenzando a aparecer en otros países en los que directores extranjeros estaban produciendo su propia saga. La película italiana Il Sonne del Zorro o El Sueño del Zorro incluía una joven extra llamada Sofía Silicone, luego conocida como Sofía Loren. En los Estados Unidos, lo más parecido a una nueva película del zorro fueron series del oeste como Don Daredevil Cabalga de Nuevo o El Hombre con el Látigo de Acero, pero fueron simples imitaciones del personaje. Parecía que el zorro había alcanzado el tope de su popularidad en 1940 y Johnston Macaulay, quien creó al zorro y poseía los derechos del personaje, estaba listo para venderlos. My father was a uh, theatrical agent in, in Hollywood. One of his clients was Johnston McCulley. They were close friends and uh, had a, a close relationship over many years. At some point in the late 
uh, 40s and early 50s, my father uh, bought out Macaulay's interests entirely, bought all the copyrights and so forth. Well, my father no sooner acquired the rights than he turned around and went to his good buddy, Walt Disney, and said, hey, Walt, do you want to do this? And Walt thought it was a wonderful idea. Walt Disney había planeado originalmente que El Zorro fuera su primer programa de acción de televisión en vivo, pero los planes fueron cambiados cuando se hizo la premiere de Disneyland. Pero fue David Crockett y no El Zorro quien apareció. El Zorro se había postergado indefinidamente. El astuto hombre enmascarado había sido vencido por el sencillo hombre con sombrero de piel de mapache. Parecía que para los años 50 en Estados Unidos ninguna audiencia aceptaría otra vez al héroe español. Parecía que finalmente el zorro cabalgaría hacia el atardecer para mediados de los años 50. El héroe americano de Disney, David Crockett, era muy famoso. No parecía haber lugar en los corazones de los norteamericanos para el zorro. Pero David Crockett no mató al zorro. De hecho, le abrió el camino. Well, I think uh, the Disney series was really, uh, or Zorro, uh, was sort of the son of David Crockett. Uh, with the enormous success a few years earlier of Davy Crockett, uh, Disney wanted to get involved in, in these kind of American heroes. Although uh, uh, Zorro was Spanish, uh, it was an American creation. And he saw the, uh, the value in that. Aparece Armando Catalano, actor desconocido y modelo, que había cambiado su nombre por Guy Williams para que sonara más norteamericano. He was a first-generation Italian from New York City. Um, he went out to Hollywood uh, in the late 40s, worked at MGM, Universal, and when the call went out for Zorro, uh, he was there. He had, he had the look, and it was really perfect for Zorro. And he also had some prior fencing experience, but I always felt that it was that big smile uh, that was really uh, beneficial uh, to him in getting the role. I first heard about Zorro when um, Guy was called to go on an interview for Zorro. And when he came home, he was so excited about it because it was something that absolutely fitted his personality and background and everything about him. Before he heard uh, who was going to do the role, they were building the Zorro set. And uh, we'd get in the car and we'd drive over to Griffith Park and park up high above the Disney studios and watch them build a set. And he'd watch gleefully and hopefully, thinking that was the thing he most wanted to do. The Walt Disney Studios presents Zorro. El 10 de octubre de 1957, debutó El Zorro, protagonizada por Guy Williams. Cada jueves a las 7 y 30, millones de televidentes veían un zorro que se identificaba con esa generación. Castillo would not dare to try to rob the cuartel, wouldn't he? Come on. Había mucho más en el programa que un simple zorro. Henry Calvin, como el gracioso Sargento García, y un Jim Sheldon, como Bernardo, falso sordomudo, formaban parte del colorido elenco. A pesar de que estos personajes fueron introducidos por primera vez en 1919, en la historia original del zorro, la serie de Disney redefinió sus personalidades. El talento de los actores, el guión y el trabajo de los dobles ayudaron a que el programa fuera una sensación y su comercialización fuera una mina de oro. An interesting feature of the Zorro merchandise was a lesson learned from Davy Crockett a few years earlier. Uh, Disney was not ready for the deluge uh, of requests for Davy Crockett merchandise. They had no idea that this was going to happen. They were ready with Zorro. They flooded the market with everything from wallets to little figures to swords to whips. Uh, costumes, uh, play sets, anything you could imagine, uh, it was covered. Uh, kids loved it. 
There were lunch boxes made by Aladdin, and there was the costume made by Ben Cooper. Matter of fact, the Ben Cooper company said that the costume was their biggest selling costume ever. It outstripped all the other costumes by 60%. And uh, there were the chalk tip swords. Empire Plastics made them some little swords that had chalk on the end to make the sign of the Z. There were Zs everywhere. Los visitantes de Disneyland iban a ver al zorro en persona. Guy Williams hacía presentaciones junto con sus rivales del programa, incluido Brit Loman, que personificaba a Monasterio. One of the things Disney was very, very into with personal appearances. He said it's not only important to do a good job on the show, but you got to go out and plug it. And we went out and we plugged it. And one of the places we plugged it was we went out to Disneyland. And there we did a fencing routine on the old steamboat. And uh, then uh, a guy was supposed to jump on his horse and ride away. Well, the first time we did it, we had this wonderful fencing routine on the, on the, the steamboat. Of course, I was finally disarmed and dishonored. And, and Guy, you know, triumphantly walked down the gangplank and leaped on his horse. And unfortunately, he went over the other side of the horse. You see, it fell right on his tushy. Por supuesto que esto nunca le pasaría al zorro en el programa de televisión. Este era uno de los proyectos favoritos de Disney, y él personalmente pensaba que todo iba perfectamente bien. They built uh, an enormous set on the back lot. Uh, they spent about $75,000 per episode, which in those days uh, was a lot of money. It's not today, but it was one of the most expensive shows on television at the time. And it, it all went into the production of the show. Costumes, uh, the fencing was very expensive to film and to produce, the rehearsal time. He really went about it as he went about everything in a first-rate fashion. A Disney le gustaba tanto el realismo que insistía en que los actores usaran espadas verdaderas en las escenas de duelos. When we first started uh, uh, our first fencing scene, uh, the first couple of seconds of the scene, Guy forgot one of the uh, movements, and instead of uh, a point to the body, he cut to my head, and I couldn't get it in time, and kind of his sword grazed the top of my eye, the eyelid, and Guy, of course, was, you know, tremendously apologetic and almost in tears. <laughs> he said, I've heard him, I've heard him, my God, the first couple of seconds. And I said, Guy, it's a scratch, stop it, you know? And I kind of have a little scar to this day from it. A pesar de la gran popularidad de la serie, Walt Disney la canceló en 1959. El alto costo de la producción del programa trajo problemas con la ABC Network e hizo que finalizara la serie solo dos años después. Pero para principios de los 60, El Zorro todavía era una sensación. Episodios de la serie eran reeditados en especiales de televisión y en películas. Los niños consumían todo lo del Zorro y Guy Williams, todavía bajo el contrato con Disney, continuaba haciendo presentaciones personales. Guy Williams was the perfect choice for Zorro. It was probably the perfect part for him too, because he never had another part after that that fit him quite as well as Zorro did. La serie del zorro de Disney, que había causado sensación pocos años antes, desapareció de la televisión norteamericana cuando nunca se materializaron los planes del relanzamiento de la serie a mediados de los años 60. Sin embargo, Disney lanzó el programa en otros países y Guy Williams continuó dejando su marca en audiencias extranjeras. Guy began to get requests uh, to go to different uh, places at, um, when they would have their peak time, when the, uh, uh, ratings week. And uh, one of the places they asked him to come to was Argentina for ratings week. And uh, he started uh, going down there and loved it. He went alone the first time and he came back and he said, you won't believe what happened down there. Uh, the airport must be 30 or 40 miles from the city and completely all the way along the route just throngs of people watching the car go, watching him go by and uh, you'd go into a restaurant and, and the entire restaurant would stand and applaud um, uh, over many, many uh, strange experiences like that. Guy Williams, quien una vez trató de despojarse de su traje por miedo a ser siempre identificado como el zorro, 
se mudó a Argentina, donde podría ser el zorro por siempre. Continuó haciendo presentaciones personales, a veces acompañado por un Henry Calvin, mucho más delgado, que hacía el papel del sargento García. En los Estados Unidos se hizo una nueva versión de La Marca del Zorro en 1974, como película para la televisión. Su protagonista fue Frank Langella, pero tuvo poco éxito y la película no contribuyó mucho en la carrera de Langella. En los relatos del zorro, el humor siempre ha sido parte importante del programa, pero en 1980 apareció la primera parodia del zorro. George Hamilton, Lauren Hutton y Brenda Baccaro fueron los protagonistas de La Espada Alegre del Zorro. Oh, I thought it was brilliant, and I thought George Hamilton was one of the funniest men that I, that I knew at the time, and that he had done Love at First Bite, and had done this incredible comic character of Dracula, and that he was now about to approach this romantic character of Zorro, and doing Zorro as two brothers, one being gay and the other one being straight. I thought it was total genius. En 1981, El Zorro apareció como un personaje de tiras cómicas con la serie animada de las nuevas aventuras del Zorro. De todas las versiones norteamericanas del personaje, en esta fue la primera vez en que El Zorro, o al menos su voz, era desempeñado por alguien con herencia española, el actor Henry Darrow. Darrow tuvo la oportunidad de protagonizar en vivo al Zorro en El Zorro y su hijo, de Disney. Una comedia que se transmitió brevemente en 1983. La serie, que mostraba a Bill Dana en el papel de Bernardo y a Paul Regina en el papel del hijo del zorro. Zorro's son was uh, Zorro's getting on in years. Uh, he has a son who doesn't know he's Zorro, and he sent that son away to Spain to go to university. So now Zorro, uh, uh, what I think what happened was that I come back from university and. I discover my father Zorro. You Zorro? So he passes on the legacy. Well, it, the fact that um, that it was Zorro at the age of 50, which was my age at the time, it was Zorro who had whose feet hurt, my feet hurt, uh, his back could go out of whack, my back could go and did on occasion on the show. So, Zorro grows too old, does he? Whatever I have lost in youth, senores, I have gained in wisdom. Hi, Chihuahua. For instance, if God wished us always to jump, why would he have given us stairs? So, and I got to wear Guy Williams' wardrobe, but they had to shorten it by three inches because he was 6'3 and I'm only six. So that was fun, and I, um, at the time, I could fit into it. I don't know that I could fit into it now. La serie solo duró seis episodios. Guy Williams había pensado en regresar de su retiro y protagonizar nuevamente El Zorro, y había asistido a la audición de El Zorro y su hijo. Pero estaba quebrantado de salud y regresó a Argentina. En 1989, Guy Williams murió a los 65 años. En 1990, se pasó la antorcha cuando la nueva serie de televisión del Zorro debutó con Duncan Regard en el papel protagónico. Zorro, es un actor, es un dream, es un play. You get to do all those things you wanted to do as a kid. You play with swords and run around uh, with, uh, well, maybe not the girls so much, but you know, you, you do get to uh, do the sword fights and ride horses and make believe. It's lovely. En 1993. Zorro volvió a las tiras cómicas desde donde empezó cuando Top Comics mostró al personaje en una nueva serie de libros de aventuras de tiras cómicas. I think Zorro is such a good subject for comic books because he's such a visually dynamic character. He's not a cruel man. He should never have a really mean, cruel look to him. But he looks so great when he's riding across the landscape, when he's riding in the mountains, or when he's coming up to those haciendas. I love to see Zorro creeping over those terracotta rooftops. If somebody told me when I was a kid that one day I would be writing Zorro, I, I could not have computed that. I would have just gone, what, what, what are you talking about? I mean, that, that, seemed to be, that would be impossible. Why, why would someday somebody pay me cash money to write about Zorro? I love Zorro.
Desde sus humildes comienzos en 1919, El Zorro ha atrapado la imaginación de todas las generaciones que siguieron. Con el transcurrir del tiempo, quizás ha cambiado su apariencia, pero sus objetivos nobles siguen siendo los mismos. Mientras que innumerables chicos malos han intentado detenerlo, nunca ha sido vencido. Pareciera que el zorro seguirá luchando por el bien en las futuras generaciones. Thing that, that makes him different. 